alone but not lonely. So this is a concept that I've been playing around with in my head that it just kind of came to me a while back that a lot of people that are from my side of the business, I'm talking recruiters, credentialing managers, account managers, CEOs, you name it, anybody that's involved from a travel agency's uh, standpoint probably doesn't have a great appreciation for what it's like to constantly be traveling. And for many of you, not all of you, but for many of you, you guys travel alone, which means a new setup, a new you know set of friends, a new set of coworkers, but a lot of time by yourself. So today, I'm going to invite Sandra Rodriguez. She is the author of um, Choose to Prevail, really awesome book. I just finished reading it because I wanted to be prepared for this episode, and she's got, a, first of all, she's dynamic as all get out. Really enjoy talking with her. So today, I'm going to invite her on. And we're going to talk about a number of different things, but we're eventually going to get our way to work around. I want to talk to her specifically about being alone, but not lonely, which happens to be a title of one of her chapters, Chapter 9. So we're going to talk today with Sandra Rodriguez, uh, again, author of Choose to Prevail, about being alone, but not lonely, on today's edition of Travel Evolved. This is Travel Evolved. I am Mark Holloway. So excited to uh, get going on today's episode. Uh, it's, it's been just, I'm getting my headset already. I've got Sandra holding, and um, she and I have coordinated this time out because we both happen to be on the West Coast. She, she's out here now permanently, but really looking forward to talking uh, with Sandra about her book, Choose to Prevail. Awesome read, unique perspective. Sandra, a communications uh, expert. And she comes with things at a different perspective than a lot of people. She's a former editor for a Mexican newspaper called Reforma, which is one of the most, you know, I guess, influential publications in, in Latin America. So she's got a huge amount of experience with her. She's uh, translated tens of books from, um, from both English to Spanish, I believe, primarily, not the other way around. Um, she has a, just a wild, unique experience. And when I was reading her book and we were talking about having her become a guest on Travel Evolved, one of the episode, or one, sorry, one of the chapters that really stood out to me was the chapter she titled "Alone but Not Lonely." And as I was reading it, it really started to resonate with me personally. There was a lot of information I was getting out about things that I don't do enough of, and that travelers have opportunities to. We talk a lot about things like this on Travel Evolved. It's become what I think is rounding out this podcast and this YouTube channel to help you guys elevate everything. It's not just about evolving your financial situation or evolving how you bully agencies. I want you to do all that stuff for sure. But it's also about your mental spirit. How do you elevate your overall satisfaction? Like I said, I think last week, I want you guys when you're done and you retire from being a traveler or you retire from healthcare in general for you to say, I did it all. I did everything I want to do. I took this new career of mine of being a healthcare professional, a traveling healthcare professional, and I took full advantage of it. We talk about going to places, getting involved in new things, meeting new friends, but also we don't talk enough about being alone and all the actually wonderful things it brings. So I wanted to have Sandy come on board because as we've been talking, I'm like, oh, you got you to be a guest. You got to be a guest to this because she's also done a quick uh, 12-part series that she's going to be showing. I'm going to ask her about that toward the end about uh, just having some unique guests that she's done that have, have gone through some sort of you know life experience that has been difficult, and they've overcome that, and they've chosen to prevail. So they, it was a playoff of her, 
her book that they said, let's make a quick little series about this. I want to ask her about that. But today specifically, we're going to talk a lot about alone but not lonely. And as I was reading this chapter, like I said, I was getting excited about how many things applied to being a traveling healthcare professional. And by the way, not just if, you, if you're traveling alone. If you travel with somebody else, another traveler or a spouse or a partner, this still will apply to you. There's some really good stuff that I'm excited to talk to uh, Sandra about. And we, we briefly talked on the phone a few times. And I'm just, I mean, I, this is a guest I'm excited about because she's, I mean, I'm excited about all my guests. They've all been fantastic. I've got a whole bunch more coming. I mean, everybody's bringing such a wild and unique experience to this. And I'm so appreciative of everybody that's joined us. And for those of you that are scheduled to, and hopefully many more of you that are out there watching me, listening to me, that would like to become a part of this and have, be a guest. Because like I've always said, nothing is off limits. We can talk about anything you want to, good things, bad things, things that are driving you nuts, things that you think people should know about, helpful tips, you name it. So today, you know, we're going to talk with Sandra about all the different kind of things that she's done. Primarily, again, I, I do want to give her a plug because I think it's important. This is a book you guys should check out. And I, I, we've had authors on previously, but this is kind of a, a different perspective. And I'm really excited about getting, I don't want to spend too much time because I want to get on with her because I know that she's going to have a lot to say. So she's in that green room, as we always talk about, so sophisticated here on Travel Evolve Waiting. But I want to get her on so we can just jump right in and uh really have a conversation about the things that you guys should look forward to the positive wonderful things i'm not quite ready that the positive wonderful things that you guys should be looking forward to that have to do with being a traveler and being alone on the road it's just kind of cool and you'll see what i'm talking about as as we get going but um she's been patiently waiting because we just got going on this thing and i got her on board she's there live ready to go so let me jump on uh with sandra and let's pull her up there she is. Hey, Sandy, how are you? I'm doing very well, Mark. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm very excited. Well, we appreciate that. And thanks for taking some time out to, uh, to join us today. So super interesting guest. Um, obviously, I, mean, I just want to jump in. And, and, and the book is called Choose to Prevail. And as you and I were talking a while back, a few, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked a little bit about a certain chapter. I'm going to get into that in a minute. But there was something I really wanted to get you on for, which I think is so pertinent to the traveling healthcare professional. So um, I've already talked a little bit about who you are, but give us a little a little rundown of, of who Sandra Rodriguez is and tell us a little bit about your history and your background. Absolutely, thank you so much. Well, even though I personally have not been a traveling nurse ever, I have a lot of experience, uh, career experience, that I believe allows me to feel a strong empathy for what traveling nurses go through. I uh, worked for many years as an editor for one of the most influential newspapers in Latin America. And at a certain point in my career, to be honest, when I was probably at the height of my career, I took a very bold and risky step and I decided to move to LA from Mexico City and basically begin a new career from scratch in a place where I had well, basically no friends, no family. So I can certainly relate to the experience of being in an entirely new town. And let's be honest, every new day on the job, no matter how long you've been a traveling nurse, is always going to be a little bit like the first day of school. And how well you cope with that depends a lot on your personality type the types of things that interest you. I do believe that oftentimes people that gravitate toward travel nursing are the adventurous type in yeah. the sense that they're they're looking forward to seeing the world. And I can certainly relate that um, to relate to that as well. I personally have lived in uh, Puerto Rico. I lived in Philadelphia. I've lived in... Um, Which is a lot like Puerto Rico, isn't it? <laughs> Very similar, and even more similar to another place I lived with, which is uh, Seoul in South Korea. Really? <laughs> yes. And, well, obviously now I live here in L.A., so I do, yeah. I do understand that a lot of adapting comes uh, with the territory when you're the type of person that enjoys a nomad-like lifestyle. Yeah. But still, I, I do feel that this is something very important to address. One thing I like very much about your your show, your YouTube, your podcast, Mark, is that traveling nurses, firstly, um, they can be subject to a number of predatory agencies or difficult situations, and I believe that your business takes care of that up to a certain degree. Whoever um, 
chooses to affiliate themselves with what you are now uh, bringing, at least will be, let's say, safe from a professional standpoint or, or a career development standpoint, but they might not be safe from the personal issues that go along with um, switching one's um, residence, place of residence, yeah. uh, you know, the circle of people that surround you. So that's something that really uh, no employer can do for you. It's something that you need to do for yourself. Yeah. And I would be very happy if you would like to uh, for us to discuss that particular topic today. Yeah, definitely. And remember, these guys, as you as you and I talked about, these guys are doing something potentially new every every three months. And a lot of them do stick around if they like where they're at and the hospital extends them. But there are a lot of travelers out there that literally are doing this four times a year. So, And you're right. There is definitely a, a persona or a personal trait that allows these people to want to get these people driven to actually go out and have this nomadic lifestyle. A lot of times they're just tired of the you know what that's going on at their home facility and they just want to get away from some of that because hospitals let's be honest are full of a little bit of drama there is that element and i've been told by many travelers that is one of the top reasons but a lot of them definitely do want to get to see our beautiful country and to again have that adventurous lifestyle but you're right bringing that bringing with it there is some safety and concern so yeah let's just jump right into that let's talk a little bit about Absolutely. what you what you mean Mike. tell us a little more what you, where, where you're going with that well what I think is that one definite upside of the traveling lifestyle or being a travel nurse is much like what you were expressing, it's nearly impossible to get overly caught up in drama or office politics or hospital politics. So that's a definite upside, it's a definite upside. Yeah. And the other thing is that when people don't see you every single day and know they will not see you every day for the rest of their lives, normally they're more uh, pleasant, normally they're nicer. Why? Because you're kind of their guest, you're kind of their visitor. They're trying to make you feel more at ease. So in a certain way, it could be an upside. But then on the other hand, you have the other side of the coin. Certainly every single person might be, regardless of their choice, if they are permanent employees, if they are temporary employees, no matter what they're doing, everybody at a certain point in time might feel jealous of the other person mm -hmm. saying, oh, well, but they have all these benefits or, oh, they get to travel or they make more money or, but they have these friendships. So it's really a, a very, um, normal part of human nature so in that regard as to the social interactions that might come up uh, firstly i think that no matter what your uh, situation is when you look at another co-worker or person in your place of work and you feel jealous of their situation bear in mind that you don't know the full picture for example right. somebody that looks right somebody that looks like they might be doing great you never really know and i think that also applies in in life in general how uh frequent it is that we see people uh well i mean certainly it happens when we are looking at people's online profiles but even in real life we might see a person and think oh, uh, the CEO of that company is making so much money, I'm so jealous, or that other person, she has a wonderful marriage, and I wish I had a fabulous marriage, or, you know, that kind of a situation. But yeah. we never do know the full picture. Maybe the person that is making a lot of money is struggling with a health issue. Maybe the person with a fabulous marriage is deeply in debt. I mean, there are many things that make up everybody's individual situation. Wouldn't you say and that most people have that? I mean, I, I almost would think, and maybe I'm wrong, in, in my uh -huh. wisdom, I sometimes think that that's more often the case, that most of us in this world don't have what we people think we have. Everybody's got great things in their life, and everyone has some not-so-great things in their life. And I agree with you. It's really easy to sit there and look at what image someone's projecting, but... I'm telling you, there is a lot of stuff underneath it. I mean, I know there is with me. I mean, I certainly I don't have to live a perfect life. Do you? I don't. I mean, you, you, to me, you look at like you have a perfect life, and I'm sure that you say privately, <laughs> nope, not so much. You know, it's very true. I think that in if we were to let's say see the balance of what our life was like when we reach the end of our lives, we will see that we have a pretty even balance. The good, the bad. That's just the nature of. Of, right. uh, and that's artistic. when you get the honesty about what your life really was when you're at the end. You, you, we go through, especially this era, this this time in our lives, or this, this time in our history, I should say. 
it seems like we go through all this stuff, and there is a lot of outdoing, you know, outdoing the Joneses, so to speak. And 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 I I believe personally that when you're at the twilight of your life, that's when we're all going to look back and say, what what did I accomplish? Was it wonderful? And was I happy with me? Was I happy with what I did? Did I live life to its fullest? Because like I've said many times on this podcast and this YouTube thing, I don't. I think you only go around once. I don't know any differently. So was it the life that I wanted it to be? And I think everyone should try to do their best not to have any regrets, no matter if that's relationship, lifestyle, things you want to do, things you want to accomplish, and, and everything. I all sold up into one. Oh, absolutely. And definitely it's very important to approach uh, people in our place of work with that understanding that we never have the full picture. And in fact, even if we think we do, we might be mistaken. A lot of people might appear to be like they're doing very well financially. You might say, okay, they're dressed in designer clothes from head to toe. They have these uh, wonderful homes, a vacation home, the car, all of these things. And in fact, they even told me how much money they make. Well, even so, I mean, you never know. The person could be lying. They could be building themselves up, who knows? Or they might be lying in reverse. They might pretend to be a little bit less well off so as not to instigate envy. Uh, whatever they own or have might be bought on credit, whatever. I mean, you never really know. No, so it really right. does not behoove you in any way to go around feeling jealous of people. Now, whether they're jealous of you or not, well, you cannot control for that. But at least your own feelings you can keep in check. Right. Now, as to how to approach a new group of people, well, by the very nature of the job, I would venture to say that many traveling nurses are extroverts, and that might be a little bit easier for them. But I would say that I can guarantee that that is not the case for each and every traveling nurse. Certainly, sure. there are different personality types. Now, here's the thing. Oftentimes, when we come across a new group of people, we might feel that they're being snotty or distant or rude or cold and we might be completely mistaken here's the thing especially in high pressure situations such as in a healthcare setting Mm -hmm. you never really know the person might be preoccupied the person might be thinking about the next thing they have to do the person might be sleep deprived the person might be well from a culture where um, a lot of enthusiasm is not normally expressed. There are just so many different reasons. So because in reality we don't know why people might be acting like that, it doesn't even make sense to say, "Oh, he's so rude. He didn't say hello." Or no, no, no. Don't don't even even bother trying to uh, understand their thought their thought process because you will most likely just drive yourself crazy and it's it's not not necessary or beneficial quite the contrary i mean there is a theory that people live up to whatever thoughts we have about them in the sense that i'm going to throw an example out there for example if this is not within the traveling nurse uh, realm but just as an example of how this could possibly work let's say that i'm going to place a call to a customer service line I guess we can all agree that normally these calls tend to be lengthy, service tends to be slow if we get any. It's uh, These calls, I mean, nobody really relishes this type right. of call, right? Yes, ma'am. But if, <laughs> but if I go into this call thinking it's going to be horrible, I'm going to be on the line for 50 minutes, and this person will obviously be very rude, I will get terrible service, right? Done that, done that. <laughs> Pre-existing well, condition becomes the reality. Yep. Perceived exactly. condition. Exactly. And obviously the way that you're going to uh, start off the conversation will be like, ah, I have this issue. So obviously the response you're going to get is not going to be favorable. It will be very hard to um, to get what you want or get what you need. Whereas if you approach the conversation honestly with a with a different perspective, either putting yourself in the shoes of the operator who clearly does not have uh, a job that they enjoy, uh, you might be a little bit more sympathetic to their situation. Or if you simply go in thinking, I'm probably going to find the one helpful person that I need. I'm sure the interaction will be quite swift and it will be quite helpful. You know what normally tends to happen? And I mean, whether that's I'm sure many proponents of positive thinking might say that it's something that has to do with with expectations. The reality is that, in general, in any interaction, people do tend to 
give you what you believe you're going to get. So if you go into um, a new work situation assuming my co-workers are going to hate me, they will find me uh, annoying, this will be terrible, I will never make a single friend, it's just going to be awful, that will most likely be the experience that you're going to have. Um, and here's the thing, um, as a new person, obviously, people are already friends. They're friends themselves, they know each other, etc. So, of course, you're going to have to, like, walk into a new group, kind of try to make people get to know yeah. you, like you are at the very least visible. But there is one definite upside. If you're being called in to help at a specific facility, it stands to reason that they need you. So you can pretty much stride in thinking, I'm like a celebrity. I'm walking on the red carpet and I'm walking in through the door. Why? Because they need me. Right. They need me so bad. They're paying money to have me fly in and come in here. I mean, they're flying me in. They need me that bad. So you can walk in with the confidence that it's not like you're occupying a space where you don't belong. Quite the contrary. You're being welcomed. You're being brought in. You're being paid to be in this particular place. Right. So you can feel confident in knowing that, that you're wanted and needed. I guess and confidence with, 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 mm -hmm. with uh, an understanding that you still have the job to do, but yes, you're right. I think going into the attitude that I'm needed here, I'm wanted here, but at least by, by the higher ups, by maybe potentially yes. the manager, maybe not some of the, my coworkers, they may be, like you said a few minutes ago, have a perceived jealousy based upon their thoughts about how much money I'm making, the wonderful, glamorous lifestyle that they think I might have, when in reality, that, that may not even be the case. I may leave that facility and go home to my Airbnb and sit there by myself and watch you know, a, a fire stick and just see what's on. That may be my entire life in existence. I might be miserable, but I do think that, that going in with confidence, I think, is, um, is a, good, a good place to have your head when you first start an assignment. I would agree. Absolutely. And while it's true that whoever made the decision that you were wanted and needed is somebody obviously higher up on on the pecking order, the reality is that nobody's going to make that decision and spend uh, money right. to bring in people if the staff or whoever is at your level is not swamped. Yeah. There is no, I mean, if I walk into a place where people at my level have a lot of time off, I would find that very disconcerting. I don't think that would be the norm. I think that I would normally walk into situations where people are stretched very thin. So even if there's a little bit of jealousy at play or any circumstance that might not be ideal, in the end or on some level, they are grateful to have you there. They are. Right. Even the snottiest person, even a person that might actually you know, express animosity, even that person on some level stands to benefit from your presence. Yeah, they can, they're going to have less less workload, they're going to be exactly. having some patient care and all that exactly. all that kind of stuff for sure. And like, and again, let's let's jump into um, one of when I was reading the, when I was reading the book, one of the things I really liked was this was 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 your chapter number nine, which you titled Alone But Not Lonely. And that really resonated with me because I've never traveled. I, I have traveled for a business when I, 20, <laughs> 23, 22 years ago, when I first got into this industry, I ended up, believe it or not, I ended up living in, in Times Square of New York City and I was more lonely there than I've ever been in my life, surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people, but I was alone. And um, it was, I, I mean, I was lonely and alone because I was very young and I didn't really understand um, the opportunities I had, and I did start to eventually learn to take advantage of the atmosphere I was in. Looking back, I, I, I really regret not doing more and seeing more and taking a little bit more time for myself, which is when I was reading that chapter, it really struck me that, wow, this is very similar. I can't speak what it's like to be you know, on the road on my, on by my own. It sounds like you can, but, but certainly as a host of this uh, podcast, this YouTube channel, there's a lot of disadvantage I have where I can't always speak on behalf of these folks. So. One of the things I looked at was you said boredom can be a luxury in your book. Tell me, tell me what you meant by that. It can absolutely be a luxury. If anybody is ever bored, oh my goodness, now I'm the jealous one. Okay, <laughs> here's the thing. If you are in pain, you're not bored. If you're deeply depressed, you're not bored. If you're horrifyingly anxious, you're not bored. Being bored is basically being super contented in a good and place. With no pressing concerns. So yeah, I think that's that's so to me that when I read that I was like, wow. 
it is the complete opposite in, in the American culture, as you know now from being here, how completely opposite is what we're conditioned to. We think boredom is bad. And when you said that, I'm like, I didn't know if it had to do with your experience, but I thought it was a really unique look at what that was in boredom. And honestly, the more I sat there and I put the, put it down, I went, I mean, it's pretty deep, obviously, and I was very impressed with the thought process. But I'm like, it's true. Boredom is absolutely a luxury that now, what am I going to do with that? But I'm not dealing with any of the things you just mentioned and then some. I'm bored. So now I've got some opportunity to do things for myself that that allow me that that ability because if I don't if I can't if I'm not bored that means I'm dealing with something and I'm not in that position to even think about anything but taking care of what the problem is that I'm dealing with absolutely and especially in such a high pressure environment as healthcare where sometimes you are either saving a life or watching a life be saved and just so many things going on at the same time I'm sure that during the course of a work day well, people don't really have the time to be bored at all. Right. Not I mean, in this job. Yep. definitely not. And certainly not if you're being brought in, because right. that means that this is a place where there is a lot of activity, a lot of volume. So um, if you ever do get a little bit of free time and you find yourself bored during that uh, little bit of spare time, well, more power to you. Exactly. Now is the time to do something for yourself, to take care of yourself, to do things that will replenish you for another big and busy day the following day. Now, right. I think that even though you were mentioning that you personally have not traveled much on your own, I think that most Not a long of time, that's for sure. Well... <laughs> I'm alone right now in California. I've got a week and then I've got a little bit of company. I've got another week by myself, so I'm working. Um, but no, not typically. And I honestly, after after reading your book, I'm starting to, I mean, I just love that. I'm starting to go, hmm, I, what can I do with this time? And I'm going to talk a little about some of those things a little while ago. We're going to bring some back to my very recent experience listening to your words. Um, we talked a little bit, I said earlier that I was kind of, and I mean, I, I, I want to make sure that I finished what you were saying, but the when I said I, I didn't, I really was truly lonely in New York. You talked a little bit about how to overcome some of that loneliness. And I'm just saying for there are going to be people that listen to this and watch this that say, yeah, that's great, but I actually am lonely. I am alone and I'm lonely. How, how would you recommend overcoming some of that loneliness for somebody that's a, a health care provider? Oh, I think that this is something very important to discuss. And now that we, many of us, were um, a little bit isolated or a lot isolated during COVID, I think a lot of us have a better understanding of what being alone feels right. like or being sure. alone feels like. Um, here's the thing, as you were mentioning, being alone and being lonely are not one and the same. In fact, one of the loneliest feelings is being, as you were saying, in a crowd and not feeling a connection. And it's even worse, for example, if you were next to a, a spouse or a friend that is somehow growing colder and all of a sudden there is no connection, that could be far lonelier than being truly by yourself, no sure. question. Um, and on the other hand, being fully alone is something that many people actually relish, certainly introverts do, it's the way that they recharge. And I think that after a very, very hectic day, as many uh, people experience in a hospital or another healthcare setting, it might be even necessary just to decompress. Now, how can you uh, manage to be alone for stretches at a time? And this would be uh, a common occurrence for people that travel for work because they might not have a social circle there, at least not initially. Well, there are a number of things that, that you can do. Firstly, any time that you spend alone is the perfect time to carry out any kind of creative endeavor where you don't want to be um, swayed by the opinions of others. If you want to do something very original, maybe you like songwriting, writing poetry, maybe you are um, you're working on a business plan, a screenplay, any kind of activity that exercises your creativity is often uh, perfect for alone time. Firstly, it occupies your mind to a complete degree. You can't really be lonely because you'll be busy. And it's the perfect time to really create things that are very original because you're not being influenced by the thoughts or the ideas or the opinions of others. And this kind of creative activity, I think, offers uh, a very enriching and very balancing counterpoint to the 
life of a healthcare professional. Yeah, you even if, said that that creativity sometimes you you experience them with the people that you talked to and interviewed for the book that creativity can actually go through the roof during these periods of time if you allow that process to happen. You know, and just exactly what you're saying. Let's say you're writing a song, no one's there to critique you, no one's there to tell you this is garbage. You're there. You're gonna, you're gonna tell yourself it's garbage, right? If you think that. If it's not, you're gonna work yourself through that. So you said again, you know that. In Choose to Reveal, you said creativity can oftentimes go through the roof when you're by yourself. And I think anybody listening to that would, would kind of nod there and go, yeah, I can see that. Well, it's a situation that I've seen happen in many different cases. Often when you're surrounded by others, for example, I know that you worked in advertising for a, a lengthy amount of time. I've seen that oftentimes, let's say, there's a specific uh, style of campaign and you see something similar over and over, or a certain color that becomes very popular in, uh, in let's say, in ads that you might see in magazines, or a very specific type of photography that becomes trendy at a certain point in time. Yeah. And that makes sense because these are, these are trends. But oftentimes, uh, if you isolate yourself from the rest of the world for a moment, you might come up with something that is very far removed from these types of trendy uh, things because you're just not in contact with them. You don't have that point of reference. And it forces you to come up with something that's wholly original and not impacted by whatever is the, the norm or the fashion of the times. So sometimes that, that really does lead to some very creative, very original things, I believe. Yeah, and, and, and perfect. And what I was going to tell you, what I experienced the last couple of days, and you were in my head, so it was like, I was out here in California, as I mentioned, and I'm by myself, and I, I love music. I'm a musician, if you want to call it that. I, I pretend like I am. I, I do my best. I enjoy I used to play live, but it was just ham and egg kind of stuff. Had a lot of fun doing that. Was a, that was a lifetime ago. So I enjoy playing guitar when I can. I don't critique myself, because trust me, no one's around is great. But what I was noticing the other day, the other evening, was my enjoyment of listening to music. I was putting stuff on and discovering uh, an art, a few artists I like, and I was actually, I, I, like I said, in, in a place where it was allowing me to, to hear some other things, and I was fast-forwarding through those, and also I'd find something I like. And my enjoyment, I'm telling you, of that music, without anybody around me deciding what I was listening to, was, it was heightened. And again, you referenced this in your book, that the enjoyment of some alone time for certain things, and for me it was music, was actually elevated, and I really realized, A, how much I love that time, and how much I miss it, because I don't get to do that oftentimes with a house full of people, or you know, an office full of people, but it absolutely, my senses were heightened. I was hearing every note, every instrument, the way that each instrument was being played, and it was absolutely heightened, no question about it. I'm glad that you got to experience that more consciously. I do definitely think that your enjoyment of something such as music, as you were mentioning, or a meal, or even a movie, can be deeply enhanced by being alone. And that's something that is not intuitive, because we think that these are experiences that are meant to be shared. And of course, there's value in sharing, certainly. But the thing is that when you're entirely alone, you can really focus on the nuances of the music, the film, the yeah. flavors in your meal. And when you're with someone else, of course, conversation is also uh, a part of that. And it takes, I mean, of course, it's a different experience, but yeah. it does take away from that particular uh, experience. They say wine is supposed to be shared, but sometimes a good bottle of wine by yourself, you're really probably going to listen to someone <laughs> else telling you whether or not it's good or not, because you're like, I know what I like. So I, I definitely for sure. And then I guess just getting to know yourself again. When we were on the phone talking, you know, for when we've been speaking a lot lately, it's you, we talked about that aspect. And I, I have always said with Travel Evolved, yeah, I talk a lot about numbers. I'm really trying to educate travelers on things to be aware of. But this is also the second part of it. And I love having guests like you on that just are, are so knowledgeable of this stuff because I believe that there's an advantage sometimes to being by yourself and sometimes I think my audience doesn't always focus on that because they're so hustle and bustle they're so working about their worried about their next assignment the pay what they're gonna do and for you know within I mean good reasons for sure but getting to know yourself is healthy and I mean something we, like, we haven't stared at the clouds laying on our back since we were kids and that's kind of the the mentality I think it's like it is important every once in a while to get to know yourself. I'm guilty. There's been years, maybe decades, that I haven't gotten to know myself or forgotten who I was. 
So talk a little bit about that, because you mentioned that in your book as well. Absolutely. Sometimes we don't really have time. We don't have time to sit with our thoughts or to get in touch with uh, our inner selves. And I mean that in a very real sense. Sometimes we're rushing to get from place A to place B, or certainly in a healthcare setting, I cannot imagine anything that is more high responsibility. Obviously your focus there is outward on service, on helping, on uh, giving um, of yourself. But in reality, you also need to turn to yourself and definitely get to know who you are, think about the experiences that have made you, who you are, what you like, what you don't like. Just explore um, things in that regard. See who you miss. Is there yeah. somebody you miss? Is there somebody you don't miss? Maybe that will give you a clue as to how to restructure your relationships, uh, eventually your friendships and people in your circle. Maybe you need to cut somebody loose. Maybe you need to make more time for more Zoom calls or phone calls or emails or texts with someone that you miss more. In fact, that's also something that I recommend if you find yourself alone and you find that there was somebody, as you're doing the exercise, if you feel that there is somebody that has been very impactful in your life, it could be a mentor, a friend, even an acquaintance, definitely acquaintances are also very, very important to one's life. Maybe you can write them a a letter Nobody writes letters these days, so that person will be deeply moved. You will be, yeah. uh, well, I mean, remembered forever. I mean, as, as a very nice person who wrote them a letter. And I think that's, that's something quite valuable. The other thing is that when you're alone, this, and this is also very counterintuitive, you don't necessarily have to spend all of your time in quiet contemplation. It's also the perfect time to get very, very fit from a physical standpoint. <laughs> I was um, going right there, and I'd love thank you for uh, that segue because that's exactly <laughs> right. And I, so yeah, keep going. I, I love where you're going with these. These guys have heard it from me for a long time. Now we're gonna hear it from you, so it's not just me saying it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Obviously, by nature, by the nature of their jobs, nurses tend to be, uh, let's say, physically fit. They're on their feet all, all day. They're going from one place to the next. But the reality is that a specific fitness routine or a specific workout can really, really work wonders, not only on the body, but also on the psyche. And it's it's very interesting because depending on how you're feeling after a long day, you can select a workout type that suits the situation. For example, if you're feeling angry, you have all this pent up energy, a boxing workout, uh, a hit workout, high intensity intervals, those kinds of things will really get rid of all of that pent up energy and just make you feel so much more relaxed. On the other hand, if you're feeling frazzled and anxious and all crazy, maybe something lighter like a, a form of yoga, it could be for some people Pilates, maybe uh, Tai Chi, many different uh, practices that they might find more enjoyable. Um, Personally, my favorite uh, way to work out is um, resistance training. I love lifting weights and I love lifting very heavy weights that requires a lot of concentration. So much so that it also occupies the mind in a way that is very relaxing. It doesn't seem like it would be a soothing uh, type of activity, but it it can be. You're focusing on your technique to to the point of being almost ridiculous because if you're lifting heavy weights, then you know a slight mishap can injure you, or you could, you know, you're not going to get accomplished it. So, much respect for that. And I do not, I do not lift heavy weights because I'm too old, and I know that I will, I will absolutely hurt myself because I've done it. I got a bad shoulder, I got a bad knee, I got, uh, it's all over the place. It, it's falling apart, but that's the way it works, right? So I agree. That's it's awesome, and you're right about that. Working out, I mean, it, by the way. You know, being alone and going to work out by the gym, I personally, I don't know how you feel, but I don't like working out with other people. It takes too much time. I don't get in my routine. I don't get the burn I'm looking for. I don't get the, the muscle fatigue that I need in order to be able to regenerate and actually hurt those muscles so they start to repair. When I'm at the gym with somebody else, I talk. So, I mean, I put my phone down. I don't focus on anything. I concentrate solely on the workout. And the minute I'm able to do another set, I jump right in because I know if I don't, an hour and a half long workout will take me three hours <laughs> and and I'm going wow I don't think I really accomplished it. I did all my exercises but it didn't do it didn't, I'm not hurting right now I just did it so slowly it didn't happen so I, I love working out alone headphones again music for me focusing on the things and listening to like my my because I get I get winded you know if you do it right and you're lifting weights like you know it's you, you get done and you're like whew 
and your heart's your heart beats beating, and it's, you get it's, so it's wonderful, wonderful. I love I love this kind of. You can talk about this all day, and these people are all rolling their eyes out there at me. <laughs> well, I fully agree with you that sometimes doing it uh, on your own is better for a number of reasons. Often it yields better results because you're more able to focus on the muscle that you're working on. So that's something that tends to give better results. Also, I remember that there was this point in my lifetime where a beautiful state-of-the-art gym was built right next to my place of work. So most of us joined immediately. It was beautiful. However, I did not enjoy the experience of going there, uh, mostly because of this reason. This was a very hierarchical company. And I really did not enjoy seeing either people that were senior or junior to me, seeing me in uh, spandex and sweating. You know, yeah. that's, I think that's a more personal It's a personal thing, thing right? You yes. don't want to be at your, at your or, or I know that, and it's funny because I, I recently started going back to a gym and I, and I realized I missed that environment because I've been working out at home, at a home gym for 15 years because I really liked that. I'm out here, my daughter's out here, she just finished her freshman year of college and she wanted me to take her to the gym so she could, you know, have dad teach her, which I thought was really cool that she allowed yes. me to go there instead of whatever. I'm like, wow, I must have done something right <laughs> that she would allow this old guy to go show her how to do things. So she didn't want to have some friend or, you know, a guy or a girl show her. And I, and I miss it. I miss that environment and I'm really enjoying that aspect. But I will tell you, there are things that I do at home that are too silly to do in front of somebody else. If you're doing like a Kempo workout, I'm not going to do that at a gym. There are, you know, as a male or a female, there are there are things you do on the floor that you have to be careful because, just, you, know, you, you know where I'm going with this, right? You, you just, everyone could be watching and you just got to be aware of, of what you look at. So I hear you. You don't really want somebody who's working for you to, you know, be, uh, you know, checking you out while you're doing a thing or see somebody sweating or looking horrible when you have to go back and have a meeting with that person and, or, you know, disciplinary or vice versa, you know, right after that. Oh, absolutely. But here's the other thing. I do also get that many of our traveling nurse friends are probably just exhausted at the end of a work day, particularly if it's been uh, an evening shift or a very long shift or just a very grueling day. I absolutely get that and certainly sleep uh, is oftentimes the priority. But you really cannot let your workout slide. Uh, and if you need a little motivation to actually do it, because it really will benefit you in a number of ways, not only, not least in the sense that it will give you the strength to be better at your job. So that's something right. that's very important, physically and mentally. So one of the things that I would suggest for people that are not intrinsically motivated is to find themselves, for instance, a mystery novel that is tremendously compelling and get it on audiobook and listen to it exclusively while you're on the treadmill or doing whatever activity it is that you plan to do. Or get yourself a very, very compelling podcast, subscribe and say, okay, I'm only going to enjoy these episodes while I'm doing this thing. Or uh, simply your absolute favorite music, save it for those particular moments. Or if worse comes to worse, sometimes what I like to do is that I schedule something in my date book that will force me to be at the gym rain or shine for example i might say okay a month from today i will schedule um a meeting with my friends from high school okay how do you want to show up for a meeting with your friends from high school do you you want them to see that you're all tired and weak and frail no 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 you want them to see you at your physical peak so obviously that can be very motivating or you might program something like a photo shoot or something maybe a, I mean if you're super bold maybe enter a fitness contest I mean anything that forces you that forces you maybe you might uh, I don't know sign up for a marathon something that will force yeah. you personally that is something that's interesting to you and that you feel will compel you to do this thing if you look at your date book and you see okay I have 10 days before this thing happens oh that will get you to the gym for sure <laughs> you're right absolutely <laughs> Yeah, nothing like a wedding coming up or nothing like a high school reunion that you got to, you know, go to, to to get yourself into shape. Hopefully you have more than 10 days, right? So let's switch gears for now. Let's talk about, we, we, we talked again about a little bit about how being away from some of those important relationships in your life, um, whether intimate relationships or just, you know, close friends, 
how that can actually put a positive spin on the overall relationship itself to not to actually be away. And I mean, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. And, and we're not talking about conjugal visits or anything like that, but we're talking about just being away from those that you care about, how that actually really can actually build that relationship stronger. Yes, it sounds very strange. It sounds like it would be the opposite, but in reality, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, something that I believe that people that travel often are sometimes wary of is uh, starting new friendships, deep friendships or romantic relationships because they might think, I'll only be here for a couple of months and then I'm leaving, so what's the use or it'll only be painful or I'm going to, you know, just not be in touch anymore. But I don't know, I think that that way of thinking leads to a very unfulfilling life in the end because you do need relationships with a little bit of depth or heft to them and here's the thing the world is really as small or as large as you want it to be i mean these days there really is no excuse not to be in touch with people beyond right. the constraints of time because yep. distance is really not a constraint i mean everybody is a phone call away a zoom call away a plane flight away i mean everybody's close at hand in 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 many ways now um there, i think you're absolutely accurate in saying that a little bit of distance actually makes people more loving toward you and and vice versa no doubt i mean we can all think about or even imagine a situation in which we were forced to spend 24 hours a day seven days a week locked up with the same person day in and day out firstly nice. there would be there would be no conversation to be had. Like, right. for example, if, if that were the case, and I asked you, so Mark, what did you do this morning? You would say, well, you saw what I did this morning, and I would be so, how did you like your lunch? And you would say, well, you saw that I liked my lunch because we ate lunch together. And it would be like, no, it's, it's a non-starter. It's a terrible yeah. conversation, yeah. very dull. There does need to be a little bit of distance and people doing things individually so that there can be uh, a, a more exhilarating conversation and more things to do once people do come together. Absolutely. Um, yes, but uh, definitely I wanted to also offer a, a little tip for people that might be more on the introverted side and that might not uh, know how to go about making friends. This is going to be super bizarre, but it's I've, I've seen it in action many times. If you find a book with an interesting cover, this works well, of course, if you're a big reader or if you enjoy reading. Normally, people these days, uh, we read mostly on um, Kindles or, or ebook readers. Right. So they look kind of like this. So if I'm out and about carrying something that looks like, like this, nobody's going to strike up a conversation because they're going to think that I'm working. But right. normally, whenever I'm in a public place and I pull out a book, it really doesn't matter what the cover is, as long as people can tell that I'm reading for recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, men, women, young, old, I mean, they all come up sooner or later and say, oh, what are you reading? Or what did you get to read? Or is there a bookstore nearby? And that's somehow like a people magnet. It's very strange, but it's something that, that is these days unusual enough to attract attention. All right. So again, you talked a little bit about, and I want, to, I want to bring this up for those folks that are travelers that talk a little bit about meditation, prayer, spiritual enlightenment, how that can also, I mentioned, you know, I like to listen to music, but that could also, you mentioned in your book, that, that is a, that is an area that can be elevated once, you know, when you're, you, you've gotten that solitude into that place where you're in a different mental state from being alone, but not lonely. I think so. I mean, obviously, everybody has uh, a different type of spiritual practice that they might enjoy. And of course, a big part of that is uh, the communal aspect, being in communities, being in a particular church or temple or situation that you might be in. But there's also a lot of value in practicing um, prayer or any form of meditation uh, while on your own. There is a very specific Irish mystic by the name of um, Neville Goddard and there is another one by the name of Joseph Murphy. The, I'm sorry, Neville is from Barbados, Murphy is from um, Ireland. So these two mystics were of the opinion that most of what happens in your life is based on what you expect might happen. Not what you desire might happen, but what you expect might happen. Mm -hmm. And their um, way of meditating or praying, if you wish, is basically to 
go into a bit of vis visualizing and picturing things uh, that you would like to have happen as if they already had happened. For example, picturing yourself uh, signing a contract that you might be interested in or opening uh, the door to your new home or things of that nature. Now, whether one believes in that or not, um, I think it's easier to believe uh, any of these scenarios might be more realistic when you're on your own than when you are in surroundings that make you very much more aware of the reality at present. So, I mean, it really doesn't matter what specific spiritual practice you subscribe to or what you enjoy. I do think that there is value in going inside and enjoying that on your own. Uh, in addition to whenever there's time and whenever opportunity strikes, also doing that as part of that community. I like it. So here's here's where, let me throw one at left field for you. Can being a little bit selfish with your time and with yourself actually be a positive, a good thing? Not only would it be a wonderful thing, but I think that for many of us it's nearly impossible. So if they can swing it again, more power to them. What I think uh, is very important if you are to make time for yourself is basically to schedule it as just as you would schedule a meeting, just as you would schedule a doctor's appointment, just as you would schedule something. What I do personally, Mark, is that I don't like to save, uh, let's say, interesting activities or save fun activities for the weekends and just do them over the weekend. I like to at least schedule something that might be interesting to me for every single day of the week. Now that's something maybe I don't have a lot of time, say, on a Tuesday, but I might have 10 minutes for a quick hit workout. Or right. maybe on Wednesday I might have, what, 15 minutes? Well, that might be enough for a quick Zoom call to an old friend, for example. Yeah. And the reality is that you might think, well, but why would you even need to schedule that in? Well, because people these days, we're all swamped. I mean, really carving out even 10 minutes is really a luxury. And certainly for people that are on the road and they have to deal with travel arrangements and getting used to a new work environment and what a work environment it is. I mean, this is this is really high responsibility work that, that yeah. travel nurses yeah. do. So certainly, certainly it's something that either you schedule it or it's just not going to happen. You have to treat it with the same um, level of seriousness as you would an appointment with a, with a boss, with a doctor, with anybody that you might uh, that you might need. If you have a checkup, you're not going to, to not show up. You will show up. The same thing, if you decided you're going to call your friend, then you need to call your friend. I, I like that. That's that's It goes along with a lot of my own personal philosophy, and that is that it's a daily whatever. Now, you may not get to it. You may Life may come through, right? But if you've got something planned, something to look forward to, something that you can actually, and if you get to it, then it's great. And you plan that every single day. I love the fact that it could be just 10, 15 minutes. It could be something where I'm going to really go out and treat myself to a movie, or I'm going to go and find a, a, you know, a, a new bottle of wine I want to try, or go to this restaurant I keep driving by every time I go to work. Something that, that's going to you know be for me. And, and, and that's, I mean, I, I was asking it kind of, Innocently, but I really didn't know what your thoughts would be on whether or not you know being alone and, and taking some time for yourself nowadays. Like you kind of mentioned it, it almost feels like we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to have any time for ourselves because we have to be there for our friends, our family, every you know people, our employees, our employers, everybody but us. And it it does feel like I don't know what's happened in the last ten years or so, but it's really become almost where if you if you are any kind of self interest. You're selfish, and I think that's it's kind of nuts that we that we think that way. And so these travelers have that opportunity to do this and have some time for themselves, and it really isn't a selfish adventure or endeavor, I should say. Oh, not at all. I remember when I was a newspaper editor, my normal workday would be 14 hours long, 16, 18 hours long, and so on. Fortunately, it occasionally involved business travel every so often. And I remember that instead of feeling stressed out about uh, the moments that I would be, say, in the air, 
I would relish those moments because it would be the first couple of hours that I would be able to nap uninterrupted or read my book uninterrupted or do things like that, especially back in the day when people were not connected every single second. Right. I mean, obviously- Story breaks, valid. what happens? Where are you going? You got to get into that, yes. into that newsroom, there's, right? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of, of, I mean, certainly there's value in being connected at all times, but it was also very refreshing in, in my case when that was not a possibility. Remember where you couldn't use your phone on, on airplanes? That was a treat. Just for a few right. hours, I would be unreachable, and that was always... Uh, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> you didn't have a phone on your hip all the time. <laughs> exactly. That was, exactly. That, that was a luxury. I've got to get back to get my phone and call somebody. Gosh. I'm... Yes. And, Mark, I did want to mention something that I think could be very valuable for travelers. We were mentioning about the importance of nurturing deeper connections, because certainly those are the kind that, uh, you know, provide our life with the most value. But I did want to mention another concept that might seem uh, to contradict this this uh, idea of uh, the importance of developing richer friendships, but I think it bears mentioning. There's a theory called the strength of weak ties. And what this means is that there is a lot of value in casual acquaintances, more than we might expect. But oftentimes when you ask somebody, how did you find your apartment? How did you meet your spouse? Where did you buy your pet? How did you find your job? They would say, well, through an acquaintance. And if you say, oh, through a friend, they would say, well, not really. It was more like an acquaintance. And that makes a lot of sense because a very close friend might be uh, privy to the exact same information that you already have. They have nothing new to offer you in that regard. They might offer you, you know, family, familiarity and, and their, uh, their love, etc., but not new information necessarily. Whereas somebody that's just a casual acquaintance knows circles that you have no idea exist. They know other people, they know other things, they know other places, they might know restaurants you've never even heard of. So even though you might say, well, why even bother interacting with people in this town? I mean, I'm barely going to scratch the surface. I, I'm not going to really get to know them. It's still fine. You can still get a lot of value from um, a casual acquaintance. Yeah, that's, uh, you're right. And these, these men and women need to realize that take away the mentality that I'm not going to get to know this person because I'm only going to be here for 13 or 26 weeks and consider that you might make a great friend, you might have a casual acquaintance that I mean, might be on our travel, you bump into two years down the road and then he or she's on the same assignment with you and you're right, getting information, which I've always really uh, encouraged on this uh, this show, is that whether it's you know financial information or just information about your life as a, as a traveling healthcare professional, all of that's important and I, I love the idea that a casual acquaintance is great. I mean, I've been able to meet people like you, which is phenomenal. I did not think in my career, especially at the, you know, I guess I would, I'm not saying the twilight, but I'm getting up there to the point. I may have got a decade knowing me 15 more years, but I didn't think I'd have the opportunity to, to meet people outside of my industry professionally like you. And I've really enjoyed that aspect of that to getting to know and have, making some new friends like you that are just interesting to me and fascinating and I don't live in my world which I'm getting kind of bored with. <laughs> you have a different perspective on everything, to your point. And I love that. So, awesome. I knew today would be good. So let's talk a little bit about Choose to Prevail. Um, where can people get the book? Okay, it's available on pretty much any online book retailer that people care to go on. Obviously, it's on Amazon, but it's also available through Target.com or Walmart.com, BarnesandNoble.com, just any online vendor that offers books. And certainly, Amazon would be probably the easiest place to, to visit. Perfect. All right, so now if, and I know they will be, people are interested in hearing more from Sandra. So tell us how people can find find you out there. We, I did mention the 12-part series already, and, and while well, you were on hold for me. So how do people find you on, on the different the different platforms out there? Go ahead, and I, mean, I want to give you a plug, because I think there's going to be a lot of people that want to you know, follow you for just your life and your experiences and your kind of unique approach to things that made me go, hmm. And like I said, I really enjoyed your perspective, because it's unique. And I don't know if it's because of your background and all the different places that you've come from and lived, but it's definitely interesting and I think it's really healthy to have it. So where can they find you on, on the internet and on, on social media and everywhere else? 
Thank you so much. Anybody that wishes to learn more about the book, more about me, and just connect in general can do so through Instagram at Choose to Prevail. Also, there's a Facebook group also titled Choose to Prevail, so that's quite easy to find. And the book, as you were mentioning, is titled Choose to Prevail by Sandy Rodriguez. That would be me. And um, the book has done well enough that uh, right now I'm working on a video series inspired by the book. In the video series, I'm going to be interviewing 12 different individuals from very different walks of life yeah. that have overcome challenges in, sure. in many regards. Oh, definitely. <laughs> right. Definitely. Let me give you an example. There is Please. a former a former wrestler that I spoke with. He was very, very popular in the 90s. However, in his later years, he developed both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So yeah. the first thing he did is he went back to school and he became a psychologist to try to understand uh, what was going on. And when he saw or felt that there was not much that he could actually do to stop this from moving forward, he just decided to look at it from a completely different perspective and he's not even being flip when he says that there are silver linings he mentions for example that he holds no grudges because he can't remember anything <laughs> you know, right he also doesn't feel guilty about anything that he's ever done because he really doesn't remember what he did and he certainly uh, saves money is what he says because he might buy a video game and he can play it over and over and he really doesn't remember what it's about so he's trying to That's look a, at the such a healthy life. healthy attitude and he was he was famous so he's a mexican wrestler right so and he was well, pretty he's, famous he's, he's, well he was very famous in mexico but he's canadian he's from canada oh, he's canadian. but he yes, did but he did his, his career was was as a, as a mexican wrestler yes, which is really is a big a big is it it's bigger there than it is in the united states absolutely oh, much yeah. bigger much yeah. bigger this is a wrestler called uh vampiro uh from thunder bay canada and i did not know was, that Oh my goodness, he was hugely popular in Mexico in the 90s, not just as a wrestler, but as a mainstream celebrity. Yeah. Uh, so he was on covers of magazines, and there were like action figures, and he was massively, massively popular with this uh, very goth look that was so right. popular back in the 90s. So yeah, and it's just fascinating that now, I mean, obviously, uh, this has put a little bit of a damper on his wrestling career, but he's not stopping in, in any other way. He's actually working right now with healthcare professionals to, um, to stop um, people from getting diabetes. He's uh, promoting a healthy lifestyle. He's promoting good nutrition. So he's really, uh, you know, doing something quite different from what he used to. And by all accounts, he's doing great. I, I mean, if right. people... I was hoping you're going to choose him as your example because... Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know a lot about the wrestling world, but I thought, you know, when you said dynamic and unique, I, I was hoping you were going to choose him, him, him because I thought, there we go, it'd be a perfect example. So this is going to be like 12 different guests, and they've already yes. kind of been lined up. Different perspectives, different, completely different uh, backgrounds, all talking about prevailing and through different adversities mm -hmm. and things they've overcome. And it's very unique. It's not just healthcare it's it's or, or healthy like like this particular example it's everything every different thing you might have to overcome so really and, and that's going to be how, how do people find this series okay this series should be released in late fall or early winter this year through a platform titled heart of hollywood cinema they can find more information about uh this project on a website called Heart of Hollywood Magazine. So if you go to heartofhollywoodmagazine.com, you will be able to see updates about uh, what uh, what's going on with the series. At this stage, it's in post-production, so it should be ready um, soon enough. <laughs> but, in, but in the meantime, I really hope that if you enjoyed um, my conversation with Mark, who was so kind to have me here. If you would care to take a look at my book, Choose to Prevail, that's available online quite easily. Awesome. Well, I knew this would be a good one. And again, I can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your schedule. Um, fortunately, you and I are in the same time zone right now. I think you're only, well, I'd say you're only an hour away, but it could be three. But you're only a few miles away from me, which is really kind of nice. So uh, again, we were able to, to kind of schedule us around your busy schedule. So thank you so much for joining me, and um, I, I just I really enjoy this. I knew I would. So thanks so much, Sandy, for being on board. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. I told you. I told you she'd be a great guest. Um, 
you know, I could talk to Sandra for hours, and I'm, I really will say I'm hoping to have her back on again. She's got just, again, I think you guys could see it. Without really, you know, being in the world that I've lived in for 22 years, she can talk very intelligently about what you guys oftentimes go through. And I hope today you guys heard some things that were unique that maybe you haven't thought of, because I know I certainly did. And that's why I love having, you know, enigmatic, wow, I can't even talk today, uh, unique guests, we'll put it that way since I'm not going to get that word out, <laughs> that bring different perspectives to Travel Evolved. And, and this is this is so cool because now I am seeing that you guys would be able to take some of that solitude and turn it into something advantageous for you, whether it is to become inspired and do something that you always want to do, whether it would be to write a screenplay or learn how to, how to, I don't care if it's learn how to knit, learn how to play an instrument, just having that alone time to get to know yourself. Like we just talked about, it's critical. And the fact that we don't have to look at this as a negative thing, that actually this is a positive thing or could be turned into a positive thing. It depends upon your perspective. The first thing we talked about, as you heard was being bored is a luxury and what a, awesome thought that is. I hope, I hope that if nothing else that resonated with you, because if you're having the the luxury of being bored, you now have an opportunity to do anything you want to replace that boredom. There are many people that don't have the luxury of being bored. So awesome, again, awesome perspective by, by Sandy on that. I think it's really cool. So man, what a, what a good solid episode today. I loved it. As always, guys, I'm going to ask you to, you know, obviously like, Subscribe to our YouTube channel, to any podcast platform that suits you, that you like to go to, that hopefully you have other people that you listen to and other channels that you watch. Like she said, download this stuff, listen to it, whether you're working out or if you're you know, on the road and you have a certain you know, time when you aren't getting a signal or you don't have a connection with your phone that you can plug into your, or you, you can uh, Bluetooth into your car, whatever it may be. This is a great opportunity for you to be able to plug that in and, and actually listen to a, a podcast. And I hope it's mine. I really do hope I'm one of many that are helping you evolve, you know, your, your travel game and your whole life in general. I cannot thank Sandy enough. Um, Sure, she and I are going to stay in touch, which is awesome, and that's exactly what we talked about. Uh, I, I wish the best for her. I think she's going to kill it out there, and um, she's such a wonderful, remarkable guest that I, I really, uh, I really enjoyed that. So, guys, as always, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. We appreciate it, and I will catch you guys next time on Travel Evolved.